Welcome to Nation Beat. I am Janelle Norville bringing you this brief on the pulse of our nation and highlights around the heart of St. Lucia. Government to reduce transportation expenses with the transitioning of its fleet of vehicles to electric. Two new programs designed to improve quality in the education sector have been rolled out. The fight against cancer intensifies with the launch of Breast Cancer Awareness Month and the Republic of China, Taiwan celebrates its 107th National Day Anniversary. The government of St. Lucia is moving full steam ahead on its commitment to reducing dependency on fossil fuels and drawing renewable energy in the mainstream of St. Lucian living. In keeping with the recent Paris Agreement on Climate Change, the government is transitioning its fleet of vehicles from fossil fuel to electric. Alicia Ali explains that monetary savings on the government's transportation expenses are expected to be realized in the near future. In 2015, the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean produced a report on transitioning the public sector fleet. Deputy Permanent Secretary in the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Energy, Barrymo Felicia, said that the report informed the recent National Energy Transition Strategy, under which a pilot project involving electric vehicles will be used to assess what portion of the fleet can be converted to cleaner energy. The free vehicles we have procured so far, they are actually going to be used for testing and monitoring, testing to see how they perform in the terrain, St. Lucia's terrain and the topography. And um, against that, we juxtapose that, that data and we use it to make informed decisions about which vehicles are the best and what technology is best suited for St. Lucia and the fleet in general. And we're hoping once this is successful, we can take it as, as a signal, we, we show the private sector that we are indeed serious about success, serious about our transportation system, because transportation is now actually, they use the, the most amount of fossil fuel, so they have overtaken electricity production. So we're concerned, the government is concerned about this, and we are taking steps to remedy this. Public Utilities Officer Kurt Inglis noted that undoubtedly the electric vehicles are easier to maintain than vehicles with traditional engines. Yep. The question this pilot seeks to answer is whether electric cars can be efficiently used for regular government duties. For this pilot project, we're starting off with three vehicles, two passenger vehicles and one panel van. The reason why we chose to go with two passenger vehicles and one panel van is that we want to get the experience of having different kinds of electric vehicles. Traditionally, the types of vehicles that you would find in the government fleet are on the larger side, regardless of the purpose of that vehicle. Right? So we want to do something different. We want to have a vehicle fleet that suits the purpose for what it is being used for. The move away from fossil fuel began in 1992 with the establishment of an international environment treaty called the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. 1997 saw the first legally binding agreement on climate change called the Kyoto Protocol. In this agreement, developed countries agreed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions between 2008 and 2012. Since that agreement, global attempts have been made to transition away from fossil fuel. As a small island developing state, St. Lucia's carbon footprint is minuscule. However, efforts are being made to ensure that the island becomes as environmentally friendly as is possible. The transportation sector accounts for a large part of the island's carbon footprint. From the Government Information Service, I am Alicia Ali. Two new programs aimed at improving the quality, equity, efficiency and effectiveness of the education system and the youth of the country got their official start this week. Chris Satney reports the EQIP and EAP projects have been funded by the Caribbean Development Bank to a combined amount of almost 19 million U.S. dollars. The Education Quality Improvement Equip Project 
is taking on a proactive, preventative, and rehabilitative posture that promotes the empowerment of at-risk children, youth in general, and their families. The project seeks to foster a learning environment that addresses the needs of the students while at the same time ensuring the physical spaces in which they learn are safe and that education leaders are well equipped to deliver a quality of teaching in a manner that reaches all children of this modern age. On the other hand, the Youth Empowerment Project, YEP, through an integrated approach, works towards alleviating tension risk factors that can nurture antisocial behaviors at the individual, family, community, and societal levels. Portfolio manager of the CDB, Dr. Ida Medeni, says the two projects are important interventions and are critical to enhancing St. Lucia's human and social capital that are vital to supporting the achievement of the country's sustainable development agenda. These projects are also consistent with the eighth cycle of CDB's Special Development Fund. They are also aligned to CDB's strategic objective of supporting inclusive and sustainable growth and development. Our corporate priority of improving the quality of and access to education, training, and citizen security and our cross-cutting theme of gender equality. Under the EQUIP project, five pilot schools will benefit initially, including the Gordon and Walcott Memorial Methodist School, Fitbutai Primary, La Guerre Combine, and the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. Minister for Education, Innovation, Gender Relations, and Sustainable Development, Honorable Dr. Gail Rigobert, says the EQUIP project speaks to the commitment by the education sector to ensure that no child or school is left behind, including special needs institutions. For quite some time, these four project schools appear to have been given the rough end of the stick, so to speak. But the Education Quality Improvement Project, however, provides the assurance that the Department of Education remains attentive and committed to addressing the needs of all our learning institutions. Under this initiative, instructional effectiveness will be actively pursued via the provision of short-term and degree-level continuing professional development training programs for teachers at all levels of this island's education system. Meantime, Minister with Responsibility for Equity, Social Justice and Empowerment, Honorable Leonard Montoot, says within YEP, special emphasis is being placed on young men and vulnerable groups, particularly children, at-risk youth and women. The challenges that afflict our youth are not of their making, but they have an opportunity through initiatives like these to ensure that they are not destroyed or marginalized by such circumstances. We must therefore ensure that these projects succeed. Our collective role is to partner with them to provide support where required. The Department of Education, Innovation and Gender Relations is partnering with the Department of Equity, Social Justice and Empowerment, mainly on the school suspension program of YEP. The launch of the EQUIP and YEP projects preceded launch workshops being used to familiarize key stakeholders of the implementation process of both projects as well as CDB's policies and procedures. From the Communications Unit of the Ministry of Education, Innovation, Gender Relations and Sustainable Development, I am Chris Satney reporting. The Ministry of Health and Wellness held a media launch on October 4th, 2018 in recognition of Breast Cancer Awareness Month in St. Lucia. According to statistics from the World Health Organization, WHO, 41 million persons die each year from non-communicable diseases, which is equivalent to 70% of all deaths worldwide. Cancer accounts for 9 million of these deaths. Non-communicable diseases, NCDs, such as stroke, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension and cancers, are referred to as the silent killers. They aren't transferable from person to person, but are mainly due to lifestyle choices. During the month of October, the issue of breast cancer awareness, education and prevention will be highlighted. During the media launch for Breast Cancer Awareness Month, Family Life Educator with the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Janelle Alexander-Dupre, stressed on the importance of breast self-examinations to spot early changes in one's body. 
And this year, we have decided to target women in their productive years, uh, women between the ages of 25 to 50 years, but not forgetting also younger women, because they too can get breast cancer. And the earlier that we get accustomed to our bodies, our breasts, the better the chances of survival. The theme for this year's observance is Be a Breast Friend, Early Detection for Your Protection. According to family nurse practitioner Sharon Tench Nobal, early detection of breast cancer will reduce morbidity and mortality, and screening services are available at all public healthcare facilities on island. Breast cancer screening is performed to detect any changes in the structure of the breast, such as breast lumps any breast pain, discomfort, dimpling, discharge, or any abnormality in the lymph nodes, in the surrounding lymph nodes. All women are encouraged to visit the health center in the community to get their breast examined by the nurse. They will also, at the health center, they will also be taught how to examine their breast. They will receive information as to referrals. NCDs contribute significantly to losses in productivity increased economic burdens to individuals, families, communities, and the nation. Acting national epidemiologist Dr. Michel Francois said cancer is the second leading cause of death, with breast and cervical cancers being responsible for most cancer-related deaths among Caribbean women. In 2015, we had stroke, prostate cancer, and diabetes being the leading causes of death in our men, and a similar um, trend was noticed in the women with stroke, diabetes, and breast cancer being the main cause of death. The leading site of cancer death among females in St. Lucia is the breast. Breast cancer is ranked as the number one cause of cancer death among women in St. Lucia from since 2006. And the trend shows that the numbers continue to increase. Dr. Francois added that studies show the risk of breast cancer increases with age and most cases are diagnosed beyond the age of 50. However, cases have been recorded with women in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. She said many of the cancers are preventable through modification in one's lifestyle, such as decreasing in alcohol consumption, stop smoking, regular screening, early detection, and effective treatment. She encouraged all women to get their breast examination done, particularly during the observance of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. For the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Glenn Simon reporting. This is Nation Beat. When we come back, St. Lucia Distillers launches the island's first art coal project and the erection of a nine-foot bronze statue of Darren Sami. And the Republic of China, Taiwan celebrates its 107th National Day anniversary. Everyone is at risk for getting a foodborne illness. While most foodborne illness cases are mild and go unreported, long-term health complications and even death can occur from a foodborne illness. Foodborne illnesses are caused by contamination of food at any stage of preparation. If you are a food handler involved in home-based food production, meat, fish, chicken or a big shop, as a food vendor, how you prepare food can put your customers at risk. Do you know the risks and how to avoid them? The St. Lucia Bureau of Standards can help you. For more information, contact the St. Lucia Bureau of Standards at 456-0546 or email slbs at candw.lc or visit the website at www.slbs.org.lc. St. Lucia Bureau of Standards, making quality and standards our way of life. Welcome back. St. Lucia Distillers and its parent company, GBH of Martinique, have announced an exciting arts project spearheaded by preeminent visual artist Llewellyn Xavier. It involves the release of a limited edition of Chairman's Reserve featuring the artwork of Llewellyn Xavier, the launch of the island's first art pole project, and the erection of a nine foot bronze statue of Darren Sami. Fittingly, two of the island's premier saxophonists welcomed specially invited guests to the unveiling of an arts project celebrating Caribbean art and the region's finest rum. St. Lucian artist Noelin Xavier and Bernard Hayot, the chairman of GBH, the parent company of St. Lucia Distillers, unveiled a limited edition of Chairman's Reserve Rum wrapped in artwork designed by the world-renowned Xavier. 
This creative undertaking was initiated two years ago when Mr. Hayot decided to invest more deeply in St. Lucian art and culture. It starts with the realization of an art poll project, a lifelong passion and dream of Noel in Xavier. Bearing the good news was the general manager of the GBH Agricultural Division. Tonight, I'm proud to announce that the St. Lucia distillery site in Roseau will be the first home of this artistic installation. I hope that many other sites around the island will soon follow and so bring to life the full potential of this inspiring project. Mr. Noel in Xavier, lamenting the lack of monuments celebrating St. Lucia's culture and history, described this as a most exceptional enterprise and thanked the GBH chairman, Bernard Hayot, for sparking what he called a quiet revolution. For the first time in the history of art, artists from the Caribbean are discussed within a global context. The grounds of St. Lucia Distillers in the Roseau Valley will host the island's first art pole project, forming part of a major touristic attraction being developed there over the next 24 months. The manager for the art pole project commended the investment of GBH and St. Lucia Distillers. Art reaches into us and far beyond the obvious to stimulate the imagination and this is what is vitally needed and most definitely missing in our country today. The Art Pole project also includes the erection of a number of sculptures around the island. The first will be a nine-foot statue of Darren Sami, former West Indies cricket captain. It will be located at the Darren Sami cricket ground. Hopefully this whole event is something that will drive our country forward, continue to bring more visitors, you know, to, to, our, to our lands and uh, all in all, St. Lucia benefits. The Darren Sami statue will be partly funded by the St. Lucia distillers. Sami is a global ambassador for Chairman's Reserve. From the Government Information Service, I am Anisia Antoine reporting. The operations of the Computer Services Department of the Central Library received a boost this week as a result of a gift facilitated by a local firm. The 20 brand new computers and five filing cabinets were handed over to the Director of Library Services by PKF Corporate Services Managing Director Wendell Skeet. It follows an inquiry done by the accountant and business firm last year about the needs of the public library on behalf of one of its clients. PKF St. Lucia provides an integrated range of audit, tax and finance and business advisory services to private and corporate clients. The actual money for this for the 20 computers in the five cabinets actually came from one of my clients. This is a client who is a client uh, owner of one of St. Lucia's offshore companies and wanted to make this donation of a computer equipment to the central library. So I'm just in the middle, I'm just doing it on behalf of a client. Director of Library Services Cynthia McFarlane says the acquisition of the equipment pieces will put the library in a better position to improve its services offered to the general public. In the past, persons waited in line to use the computers. With this donation, access to computers and Wi-Fi will become much easier. The filing cabinets will contribute to the enhancement of the record-keeping efforts of the administrative departments of the public library. The public library needs external assistance in order to thrive. Therefore, I would like to make an appeal to profitable organizations and the general public to assist and support the public library in whatever way they can. Ms. McFarlane also informed the general public that despite ongoing works to the library's structure, the institution remains partially open. She advised the members of the public that they can now access the reading room, reference department and the adult department. The computer services department and the mobile unit, she advised, will resume services next week. From the communications unit of the Ministry of Education, Innovation, Gender Relations and Sustainable Development, I am Chris Satney reporting. The Embassy of the Republic of China, Taiwan in St. Lucia celebrated its 107th National Day Observance with a night of festivities, Thursday, 5th October at the Sanders Grand Resort. 
2017 marked a 10 years since the re-establishment of diplomatic ties between St. Lucia and the Republic of China, Taiwan. This year's celebration took a reflective tone as both parties reminisced on the relationship between the two islands. Acting Prime Minister of St. Lucia, the Honorable Leonard Montoot, commended the Taiwan partnership, saying the monetary and technical assistance given over the years continues to be an integral part of building a resilient St. Lucia. You have touched the lives of so many St. Lucians through projects big and small. In this new era, where small island developing countries like St. Lucia are struggling to access much needed aid, Taiwan has stepped up to the plate in not just providing us with monetary assistance, but as the saying goes, teaching us how to fish. The Chargé d'Affaires at the Embassy of the Republic of China, Taiwan in St. Lucia, Bill Shishang Wan, spoke on behalf of the mission. He noted that the similarities between St. Lucia and Taiwan creates a solid foundation for a relationship based on mutual trust and respect. St. Lucia and Taiwan are not just diplomatic allies, but also kindred spirits, sharing common values and mutual interests. We may be oceans apart. Nevertheless, we share many similarities. When one takes a look at the map, one will be marveled at how identical those two islands are. Geographically, we are both mountainous island states with scarcely any natural resources. Historically, we have both suffered the tyrannies of great power rivalries. Even our economies used to depend heavily on banana exports. What's more, Taiwan and St. Lucia are both democracies attaching great importance to the values of freedom, human rights, and the rule of law. The acting prime minister catalogued some of the projects and programs that has developed St. Lucia's human and infrastructural resources over the last decade. The value of the transfer of knowledge and expertise to our people is immeasurable. St. Lucia has benefited from cooperation arrangements which include the Taiwan Scholarship Program, Constituency Development Program, Fruit and Vegetable Demonstration and Extension Cooperation Project, Aquaculture, ICT Technical Cooperation Projects, Black Sikatoka Disease Treatment and Prevention Projects, and St. Lucia Taiwan Partnership Trade Exhibition, and the Government of the Republic of China and Taiwan has also agreed to provide visa-free treatment for nationals of St. Lucia to visit Taiwan effective July 12, 2017. Prime Minister of St. Lucia, the Honorable Alan M. Shasney, is currently out of state with the Ambassador of the Republic of China, Taiwan, to St. Lucia, His Excellency Douglas Shen. They are traveling to Taiwan for its National Day celebrations, which is held annually on the 10th of October. From the Government Information Service, I am Alicia Ali. That's Nation Beat. Join us next time as we feel the pulse and heart of our community. You can also catch up with us anytime on the St. Lucia Government Facebook page or YouTube channel. I am Janelle Norville.